presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand. of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. He burns with holy fire, with splendor he is crowned. Well, good morning and a warm welcome to your service today. It's good to see you here. Uh, just let me run through the announcements. I, I announced last week um, that David Surgener would be our guest uh, speaker uh, this week. Um, sadly, David's uh, father died uh, during the week, and so, of course, he's unavailable today. Uh, but do uh, remember to pray for David and the family in their time of bereavement. Uh, we meet for prayer this evening as normal at 6.30 in the Nelson Room before the service of worship at 7 o'clock. And so let me encourage you to come back again this evening to, to worship the Lord. Uh, the bright hour is on Tuesday afternoon as normal. The speaker this week is Paul Somerville from uh, Sazra. Uh, the midweek Bible study and uh, prayer meeting for all the congregation is on Wednesday at 7.45. And uh, then I think next week is Junior CE Sunday, isn't that right? looking at me yes Julian yes okay so see you Sunday uh, next Sunday morning the first uh, Sunday in February so we'll look forward to the, uh, the the children from the CE leading the service next Sunday those I think are all the announcements <coughs> excuse me we're here to worship God and in Psalm 135 it says praise the Lord praise the name of the Lord give praise O servants of the Lord praise the Lord for the Lord is good sing to his name for it is pleasant uh, well, let's do that. Let's uh, stand to praise God. And we're singing part of Psalm 135. Praise the Lord, all you his servants.
let's turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. And Almighty God, our Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer through the Lord Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, and with the help of your Spirit. And we want to praise you because you alone are God, the great God, the one who rules and reigns uh, over all uh, that you have made from your throne in heaven. We praise you because you're good, uh, you're full of love and grace and mercy and pity and compassion and patience and kindness. We praise you because you're great. You're the almighty God who can do whatever you please in the heavens and on the earth. And there's no one who's able to thwart your plans or to stop you. We praise you because you are eternal without beginning and without end. You're the everlasting God who doesn't change, but you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we therefore worship you and we praise your great and glorious name. And we ask that you'll help us to, to do that today. Help us to worship you. And help us to be aware of your presence with us so that uh, we'll worship you with reverence and fear. Help us to give thanks to you in our prayers and our praise. Help us indeed to tremble at your word and to receive it with faith and humility. Will you give faith to those who don't yet believe? Will you renew us all in your image more and more and help us to persevere and to walk in your ways all the days of our life as we wait for our Savior, Jesus Christ, to come again. And we ask these things uh, in his name. Amen. Uh, let's turn in the Bible to uh, 2 Kings chapter 9. Uh, the, the reading today is a, a long one, so we'll divide it up into two parts. And uh, we'll start with verses 1 to 16. So 2 Kings uh, chapter 9 and uh, verses 1 to 16. This is God's word. The prophet Elisha uh, summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions and take him into an <coughs> inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run, don't delay. So the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You're to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I'll avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last meal in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. And he opened the door and ran. When Jehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, Is everything all right? Why did this mad man come to you? You know the man and the sort of things he says, Jehu replied. That's not true, they said. Tell us. Jehu said, Here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. They hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram and all Israel had been defending Ramoth Gilead against Haziel, king of Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds the Arameans had inflicted on him in the battle with Haziel, king of Aram. Jehu said, if this is the way you feel, don't let anyone slip out of the city to go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then he got into his chariot and rode to Jezreel because Joram the, was resting there and Ahaziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. And uh, we'll pause the reading there come, and we'll come back to it later, but we thank God for his word to us. 
Let's uh, confess our sins to God and pray for forgiveness. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are a holy God whose eyes are too pure to look upon evil, but you promise mercy through Jesus Christ to all who repent and believe in him. And we confess that we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory, and we have wandered from your ways, and we have wasted your good gifts. We have forgotten your loving kindness to us, and we have doubted your faithfulness and goodness. We have sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we have done and by uh, what we have left undone. And we're sorry. We're sorry that we have made so little progress in our sanctification and that there's still so much that is wrong in our lives. We're sorry for all the ways that we have offended you by our disobedience. We're sorry for all the ways we dishonor you every day and for all the ways that we fall short of doing your will. We're sorry that our life here on earth falls so far short of reflecting the glory of heaven, which is our true home. And so we now repent of our sins and our shortcomings and we ask that you'll be merciful to us and that you'll forgive us for the sake of Christ our Savior who loved us and who gave up his life to pay for all that we have done wrong. So for his sake, will you forgive us and will you give us all a new and willing spirit to obey you? And so will you help us to love your law more and more and to delight to walk in your ways? Will you enable us to watch out for temptation and to resist the beginnings of sin? Will you help us to be quick to do your will? And will you hold us back from breaking your laws? And will you help us to pay closer attention to your word and to do all that you have commanded us? Lord, will you hear us? For we ask all of these things in our Savior's name. Amen. And having confessed our sins, <coughs> hear the good news from Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem his people from all their iniquities. So thanks be to God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let me invite the boys and girls to come up to the front now. Okay, good to see you. It's good to have the, the girls here today. We had just boys last week. Good to see you. Okay, uh, so we've been thinking about the, the story of, well, um, do you remember the name of the queen? Do you remember the name of the queen? Her name was Esther. Uh, so uh, she's the one in the white. You can't see her face. So she's bowing down before the king. He was a, an important uh, person, a great king. He, he ruled over lots of uh, countries. Uh, so he had a great big empire, a powerful person, and, uh, so, um, and uh, Esther was uh, his queen. And uh, here she is, she's bowing down because she wants to ask the king a favor. And uh, we were thinking about this last week. Um, she went one time and said, we'll come to a party. And uh, so he went to the party and he said, what do you want me to do? And she said, well, will you come to another party the next day? Uh, because there was something she wanted to ask him. So there she is. Uh, she's uh, bowing before the king, uh, wanting uh, to ask him something. And then we've also been thinking about, uh, well, there are two men here. There's uh, Haman, he's the man in the blue in the front, and then there's uh, Mordecai, he's the man in sort of the, the reddish uh, clothes in the back. And uh, Haman, he was the, the, the bad man, the wicked man. He hated Mordecai, and he hated all of God's people. And in fact, he'd managed to persuade the king to pass a law that uh, one day very soon, all the people in his emperor were able to get up and kill as many of God's people as they wanted. So he was a wicked man, but he's not looking very happy there. Do you see his face? He's not looking very happy because uh, he was in a bad mood uh, and he was upset because he was hoping the king would honor him. But instead of honoring him, the king had ordered, uh, honored Mordecai and he made uh, Haman uh, lead him through the the streets of the city in the king's chariot wearing the king's robe and everyone he was uh, everybody was to look up to him and admire him uh, so Mordecai's happy uh, Haman he's uh, very unhappy so we've been thinking about them as well 
But uh, on to the, really the story today. Uh, Haman, and he was in this bad mood, and he was upset, and he went home, and he was complaining to his, his wife and family about this, and this terrible, uh, how uh, the king honored Mordecai instead of him, and he was uh, really upset about it. But then the king's servants came, uh, and uh, they said, it's time to go, because do you remember? There's that party you have to go to. Esther had asked that the king and you, Haman, should go uh, and have a party and probably didn't feel like having a party. Do you ever go to a party and don't feel like it? Maybe you're in a bad mood. Maybe you're not feeling well. Uh, well, I don't think he really wanted to go that day, but he went. And so here they are. They're having their party, just the three of them, the king, Haman, and the queen. And they're having the party, uh, eating and drinking. And the king then turned to Esther and said, I know there's something you want to ask me. So now's the time. Ask me what it is. I will give you up to half of my kingdom. What is it you want? And that's when Esther said, well, this is what I want. I want you to save my life and the life of all of my people because there's somebody who wants to kill us all. And uh, the king said, well, what are you talking about? Who would dare do such a thing? You're my queen. Who would possibly want to kill you, my queen, and all of your people? Who is it? Tell me. And the queen said, well, I'll tell you who it is. The person who's trying to kill me and all of my people is Haman, who's sitting right there. It's him. He's the one who's trying to kill me and all of my people. He's the one. He's the guilty one. And uh, <laughs> no doubt Haman was shocked when he heard this, and the king was angry. He, was, he got up in a rage, and he stormed out of the room. No doubt he wanted to think, what, what's this? What's he going to do? What's he going to do? So he ran out of the room in a rage, and um, Haman stayed behind to beg for his life. And so he turned to Esther to say, will you have mercy on me? Please, please, the king's so angry with me. Please, please, will you talk to him on my behalf? And uh, he fell down in front of Esther where she was sitting to beg for his life because he could see how angry the king is. But just at that moment, the king came in and he saw uh, Haman right in front of the queen and he thought, he's going to attack her. He's attacking my wife right now in front of me. And so he was even more angry and he called for the guards to come in and they uh, tied up Haman. They took him away and they killed him because he was such a bad man. They killed him. Well, afterwards, the king gave to Esther and Mordecai all of Haman's possessions. So everything he owned, all his money, all of his houses, they gave it to them to honor them. And, uh, but they still said to him, they still said to the king, king, we still got that law. Do you remember the law that, that uh, Haman made you pass? that uh, one day in the future, all of the people were able to get up and kill as many of the Jews, God's people, as, as they want. We've still got to do something about that. What are we going to do? And so, oops, and so they, they, they again bowed down before the king and said, king, you must do something to save Esther and all of Esther's people, because there's this day coming when everybody's going to fight against them. Well, the king said, well, what can I do? I want to save your lives. What can I do? Because I can't just change the law. That's not allowed. What can I do? And so they had an idea, and they said to the king, well, listen, this is what you can do. You can write another law, and you can say that on the day when everybody's going to attack God's people, God's people are free to defend themselves, and so they can get together uh, in groups, and they can defend themselves. They can fight back, and uh, that's the law, and the king agreed and he wrote out the law. He got one of his servants to write out the law, and then they gave it to uh, the horsemen, and the horsemen went out into all of the empire and announced the news that, yes, on, a, on this day, when everybody's going to try and attack the God's people, God's people can defend themselves and save themselves. And so, whenever God's people heard this law, they all began to rejoice, and uh, they were so happy because they thought, well, we thought we were going to die but now we realize we're going to be safe because people are going to be too afraid to attack us. So we're safe. Fantastic. Esther and Mordecai have saved us. God has saved us. Our lives were in danger, but now we're safe again. And uh, that's exactly what happened. The, the people were kept safe, 
And they decided that uh, every year they were going to remember what had happened and how God had saved them through Esther and through Mordecai. And so every year after that, they began to praise God because on that day, God had saved them. God saved them through Esther and through Mordecai because God put Esther in the palace and Esther was able to go to the king and ask that he'll do something to save uh, God's people. And of course, that then reminds us of the story of the Lord Jesus. Because here are we, we all deserve to be punished by God, but God loved us so much that he saved us by his son, Jesus. He sent Jesus, his son, into the world to save us from our sins and to give us eternal life. And so, uh, just as the, all of God's people in those days rejoice, we should rejoice because instead of perishing forever because of all the bad things that we've done, we know that Christ has saved us, God has saved us by His Son. Let's give thanks to Him now. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the ways that You saved Your people in the days of Esther and Mordecai, and You made sure Esther was in the right place. Uh, to, to talk to the king and to plead with him for the life of her people. And we thank you most of all because you sent your son into the world so that we might be saved instead of perishing and being punished forever for all that we've done wrong. You sent your son to save us and to give us eternal life. And so help us, Lord God, to give thanks to you every day for him. And uh, Lord God, help us to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and for eternal life in your presence. Help the boys and girls now as they go into children's church and as they continue to learn more about uh, Haman and Esther and Mordecai and the king as they uh, learn more about the Lord Jesus Christ. And help them this coming week in all that they have to do. We pray that you'll keep them all safe and that you'll fill their lives with good things. And we pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. Great, thanks for listening so well. Do you want to go back to your seats and we're going to sing uh, Praise Him on the Trumpet. then for the children to go out. I mentioned uh, David Surgeoner's uh, father dying at the beginning of the service, so let's uh, do pray for David and the family in their bereavement. Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, you are a faithful and good God. Uh, you strengthen the weak and you heal the brokenhearted. Your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. Uh, they're new every morning and uh, great is your faithfulness. And we ask that you'll be faithful and kind to all who are grieving today and we pray that you'll uphold them in their sorrow and that you'll comfort them. And we pray especially for David Surgeon and his family after the death of uh, David's father. Uh, we pray for them asking that you'll help them in their bereavement and that you'll give them the strength they need to bear their loss. And we commit them into your care and your keeping and uh, will you comfort them by your spirit with the hope of the resurrection and everlasting life in your presence. 
And we pray too for others in the congregation who need your help today. We pray for uh, those who have been bereaved recently. And we ask that you'll continue to help them to bear their loss. We pray for those who are unwell. And we ask that you'll restore them to health and strength. And while they remain unwell, will you help them to trust in your fatherly goodness and to be patient in their adversity? We pray for those who are caring for loved ones and we ask that you'll help them with all the demanding duties they must perform. We pray for any who are anxious and troubled and we ask that you'll reassure them of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Uphold any of our members who are finding life hard and will you give them the help they need each day. We pray for those who are struggling at work because the work's difficult or the people they work with are difficult and lord god will you help them this coming week in uh, all they have to do and we remember father any from our congregation who have gone astray and we ask that you'll bring them back to the savior and to his church we also pray for a, a suffering world uh, we pray especially for all those who are suffering because of the war in ukraine and because of the conflict in the middle east and we pray that peace will be restored in both parts of the world. And we pray for those who are suffering because of natural disasters or because of poverty or oppression. And again, will you have mercy on them and will you help them? We pray that you'll bring good out of our trials by enabling people around the world to turn in repentance and faith to you and so to receive the assurance of sins forgiven and the hope of everlasting life in a new and better world to come where we will see you and where there'll be no more trouble or sorrow or sadness. And so we also pray for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. Will you continue to raise up and send out preachers to declare the unsearchable riches of Christ? And will you enable those who hear the gospel message to believe and to call out to Christ for salvation. And we pray that they will be added to your church throughout the world. And will you help your people who are suffering for their faith? And will you help all of your people around the world to remain faithful to you and to honor you in all that they say and do each day? And we ask all of these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, before we uh, turn again to God's word, let's stand to sing, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you.
Well, let's uh, turn again to God's Word, uh, to Kings chapter 9. And we're beginning at verse 17. So Jehu has uh, been anointed king of Israel in place of Joram. And uh, verse 17, this is God's word. When the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's uh, troops approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. Get a horseman, uh, Joram ordered, send him to meet them and ask, do you come in peace? The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, this is what the king says, do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace? Jehu replied, fall in behind me. The lookout reported the messenger has reached them, but he isn't coming back. So the king sent out a second horseman. When he came to them, he said, this is what the king says, do you come in peace? Jehu replied, what do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. The lookout reported he has reached them, but he isn't coming back either. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a madman. Hitch up my chariot, Joram ordered. And when it was hitched up, Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, rode out, each in his own chariot, to meet Jehu. They met him at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth, the Jezreelite. When Joram saw Jehu, he asked, have you come in peace, Jehu? How can there be peace, Jehu replied, as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? Joram turned around and fled, calling out to Ahaziah, treachery, Ahaziah. Then Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between the shoulders. The arrow pierced his heart and he slumped down in his chariot. Jehu said to uh, Bidkar, his chariot officer, pick him up and throw him on the field that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember how you and I were riding together in chariots behind Ahab his father when the Lord made this prophecy about him? Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, and I will surely make you pay for it on this plot of ground, declares the Lord. Now then, pick him up and throw him on that plot in accordance with the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw what had happened, he fled up the road to Beth Hagan. Jehu chased him, shouting, kill him too. And they wounded him in his chariot on the way up to Gur near uh, Iblim. Uh, but he escaped to Medigo and died there. His servants uh, took him by chariot to Jerusalem and buried him with his fathers in his tomb in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, son of Ahab, Ahaziah had become king of Judah. Then Jehu went to Jezreel. When Jezebel heard about it, she painted her eyes, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, Zimri, you murderer of your master? He looked up at the window and called out, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down. And some of her blood spattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. Uh, Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. They went back and told Jehu, who said, This is the word of the Lord that he spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like refuge on the ground in the plot at Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, This is Jezebel. Amen, and we thank God for his word to us. Let's pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, back in chapter 5, there was a story of the healing of Naaman. Uh, Do you remember? He was the commander of the Syrian army. He was a mighty warrior. People admired him, but but he had leprosy. Uh, He heard from his wife's servant that there was a prophet in Israel who could heal him, and so with his king's permission, He set off to Israel and arrived at the home of Elisha, who told him to wash himself seven times in the river Jordan. And at first he refused to do what the prophet said. 
that his servants persuaded him. And he went and he washed and he was healed. And when we studied that story, I said that it illustrates God's willingness to restore the world which God created and which he loves, but which, of course, has been spoiled uh, because of Adam's sin in the beginning. Because of Adam's sin, sin came into the world and spread to all of us. And sin leads to misery so that the world is now filled with sorrow and sadness and disease and death. But God hasn't abandoned the world that he made, and the story of Naaman's healing illustrates God's willingness to restore his fallen world to the way it's supposed to be, just as he restored Naaman's uh, health and life. And when we uh, study that chapter together, I, I said that we also see God's willingness to restore his fallen world in the life of the ministry of the Lord Jesus, who is God's son, and who went about healing the sick and driving out demons. He restored the lives of people who were suffering, and what he did for some people in those days, he will do for all his people fully and completely when he comes again in glory and power to bring his people into a renewed heaven and earth where there'll be no more sorrow or suffering or disease or death, but only perfect peace and rest and happiness forever. So that's what we were thinking about uh, when we studied chapter 5. And today's chapter is, in a sense, the reverse of what we saw in chapter 5. If chapter 5 was about God's willingness to restore, chapter 9 is about God's willingness to destroy. In chapter 5, he restored Naaman's life and health, but in chapter 9, he destroys the lives of his enemies. And therefore, these two chapters, chapter 5 and chapter 9, make clear to us that there are two sides to God's power. There's his power to restore and there's his power to destroy. The Lord is the almighty God. He is omnipotent. He's all powerful. There's nothing he cannot do. Uh, and he uses his great power in these two ways, to restore and to destroy, to save and to punish. The focus of chapter 5 was on his power to restore and save. The focus of today's chapter, though, is on his power to destroy and to punish. The chapter itself can be divided into uh, those two parts that I uh, read earlier, verses 1 to 16, where Jehu becomes king of Israel in place of Joram, and then in verses 17 to 37, where he destroys God's uh, enemies on God's behalf. And so we read in verses 1 to 3 of a time when Elisha the prophet uh, sent a man from the company of prophets to anoint uh, the man, this man Jehu as king of uh, Israel. Um, if you glance down to verse 5, you'll see that he was a commander uh, in the army. And we've come across his name before. Uh, so back in 1 Kings 19, the Lord announced to Elijah that three things were going to happen. Uh, one, Elisha would one day succeed Elijah as the Lord's prophet, and that's already happened. Two, Haziel would become king over Aram, and that's already happened. We were think thinking about that last week. Uh, three, Jehu would become uh, king over Israel, and that's about to happen in today's chapter. And according to the Lord in 1 Kings 19, God would use Haziel and Jehu to punish his enemies. They would be the agents of God's wrath. And so when the time was right, Elisha sent this young man to anoint Jehu. Take a flask of oil with you, he said, uh, and when you arrive, take him away from his companions, pour the oil over his head, and declare to him that the Lord has anointed him king over Israel. And those words tell you that this is the will of the Lord. The Lord made Jehu king of Israel in place of Joram. And Elisha then told the young man to open the door and run away. Uh, anointing Jehu king like that would be like lightning, lighting a fuse. So you don't want to hang around lest you get ca caught up in what's about to happen. <coughs> and in verses 4 to 10, we see that the young man did what Elisha told him to do. He went to Ram of Gilead uh, where Jehu was staying. He found him and made clear that he wanted to speak to him privately. And when they were alone, the young man poured the oil on Jehu and declared that the Lord had anointed him king over Israel. And it turns out that the Lord's message to Jehu is longer than we first thought. So the Lord has anointed him king over Israel. And now that he's king, he must destroy the house of Ahab. And when he refers to the house of Ahab, he's not referring to a building. Uh, but he's referring to Ahab's descendants, all the heirs to his throne. 
God wants, to, wants Jehu to destroy them so that none of Ahab's descendants will ever rule again. And in this way, the Lord will take revenge on Ahab for the blood of his servants who were killed by Ahab and by his wicked wife Jezebel. That's in verse 7. So it's God's will for the whole house of Ahab to perish. By the hand of Jehu, God will cut off from Ahab every last meal in Israel, slave and free. That is to say, he'll cut off in Israel every last meal from the line of Ahab. They'll become like the house of Jeroboam and the house of Baasha. Those are the names of kings uh, whom we read about in 1 Kings and who were also destroyed. And as for Jezebel, well, dogs will devour her and no one will bury her. Ahab's uh, wicked wife was still alive at the time, but not for very long. So that was the Lord's message to Jehu. And after anointing Jehu and passing on the Lord's message, this young man opened the door and he got out of there as quickly as possible. In verses 11 to 16, Jehu went back to the fellow officers. And of course, they wanted to know what's going on. Uh, first, uh, at first, Jehu tried to keep it to himself, but they insisted that uh, he should uh, tell them. And so he told them what had uh, happened. And look at their reaction in verse 13, if you've got your Bible open. They hurried and they uh, took their cloaks and spread them under Jehu. Uh, so just as the people of Jerusalem uh, made a carpet uh, for the Lord Jesus when he entered Jerusalem using, you know, palm branches. So these men made a carpet for Jehu to walk on with, with their cloaks. It was a sign of respect and honor. And they blew a trumpet and proclaimed that Jehu is king. And uh, since it was the will of the Lord for Jehu to become king, the Lord ensured that his fellow officers would give him their support. The Lord didn't leave him on his own, uh, but gave him these men to support him. And so when we read in verse 14 that Jehu conspired against King Joram, we should understand that it was the will of the Lord for him to conspire against Joram because Joram was Ahab's son. He was part of Ahab's house, which the Lord said must be destroyed. And our narrator then reminds us of what we read right at the end of chapter 8 last week and how Joram and his men had gone out to fight against Haziel, a king of Aram. And Joram had been wounded in the battle and he'd gone back to Jezreel to recover. And after reminding us of that, the narrator then tells us that Jehu got in his chariot and headed for Jezreel, where Joram was staying, and where Ahaziah, the king of Judah, was also staying. And so we come to verses 17 to 37, which are about how Jehu began to destroy God's enemies on behalf of God. In verse 17, the narrator takes us to Jezreel. And then to this lookout who was standing on the tower of the city looking out. And the lookout could see troops approaching. Uh, so that tells us Jerry didn't go on his own, uh, but he brought an army with him. And from what we read in verse 20, it seems that the troops are still uh, too far away for the lookout to see them clearly. So he doesn't know who they are. But he told the king that he could see these troops coming. And so who are they? Are they friend or foe? Are they coming to attack the city or are they coming for some other reason? The king wants to know in advance uh, so that they can prepare for a battle if necessary. So he sent out a horseman to ride out and to meet them on their way to see what it is they wanted. The horseman went out and said, do you come in peace? And Jehu replied, well, what have you got to do with peace? And he commanded the man to join them. The lookout saw this, told the king that the horseman isn't coming straight back. And so the king sent another horseman and the same thing happened. But now the riders are close enough uh, for the lookout to recognize Jehu. And when the king hears who it is, he got on his chariot and he rode out to meet him. It seems that he's not alarmed. After all, as far as the king is concerned, uh, Jehu was the commander of the king's army so he's perhaps come to report on the battle against uh, Haziel and King Ahaziah, uh, king of Judah, also went out with him. And when they met, it became clear straight away that Jehu hadn't come in peace. Uh, How can there be peace, he said, as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? 
He mentions idolatry because Jezebel introduced the worship of Baal to Israel. They began to bow down to Baal and send a bowing down to the Lord. And when Joram heard this, he, he tried to turn uh, around and get away. But Jehu uh, uh, drew his bow and shot him between the shoulders so that he died. And if you take a look at verse 25, uh, where Jehu uh, told one of his servants to take Joram's body and throw it on the field that once belonged to Naboth. And so do you remember Naboth from 1 Kings 21 uh, with uh, Naboth's, sorry, with Ahab's approval? Jezebel arranged for uh, Naboth, an innocent man, to be falsely accused of blasphemy so that he was stoned to death. And according to verse 26, she not only had Naboth killed, but his sons as well. And once Naboth and his sons were dead, Ahab was able to take over his vineyard, which is what he wanted all along. Killing Naboth and his sons was one of the wicked things which Ahab had done during his reign. And according to verse 26, the Lord foretold that the day would come when the Lord would repay Ahab on Naboth's land for what Ahab had done to Naboth. Ahab had already been killed, but now the Lord was taking vengeance on his son, who was just like Ahab. And when Ahaziah, the king, saw, the king of Judah, saw that Jehu had killed uh, Joram, uh, he fled up the road, trying to get away, but Jehu chased after him with his men, managed to wound him fatally. And Ahaziah was caught up in all of this because, uh, do you remember what it said about him in chapter 8, uh, which we read last week? Uh, it, back in chapter 8 and verse 27, it says about Ahaziah that he walked in the ways of Ahab. And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done. So Ahaziah was just like Ahab and therefore he too deserved to die. And after killing Jehu, uh, sorry, after killing uh, uh, um, Joram and after fatally wounding Ahaziah, Jehu turned his attention on Jezebel, who was in the city of Jezreel. And uh, she comes across as defiant, doesn't she? You know, instead of humbling herself and putting on sackcloth and ashes, she puts on her makeup, she does her hair. We can imagine her standing at the window in all her royal robes. And she calls down to Jehu, calling him Zimri. Uh, he was uh, someone who killed an earlier king back in, in 1 Kings 16. So we say, Jehu is just like Zimri. Uh, Jehu called for help, and uh, two or three eunuchs, who presumably once served Jezebel, threw her off the tower, and she died. Jehu went in to eat and drink, but presumably his conscience began to bother him, and he decided it was only right to give Jezebel a proper burial. Uh, even though she was wicked, she was still part of the royal family. But they were too late, and the dogs had already eaten most of her body. And this too had been foretold by the Lord, who said back in 1 Kings 21 that dogs would devour her. So it's an unpleasant chapter, isn't it? Uh, Joram was killed, Ahaziah was killed, Jezebel was killed, and her body was eaten by dogs. It's an unpleasant chapter. But it's a chapter which shows us the other side of God's power. Uh, again, back in chapter 5, we saw God's power to restore. But in this chapter, we see God's power to destroy. Just as God worked through Elisha to heal Naaman, so God worked through Jehu to, to destroy the house of Ahab. In chapter 5, we saw the wonderful grace and kindness of God because God was willing to use his power to heal Naaman who had done nothing to deserve God's kindness. God graciously and freely restored his skin. But in this chapter, we see the terrifying justice of God because God was willing to use his power to destroy his enemies who had done evil in his sight. And we see the same two things in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. When he was on the earth, God worked through the Lord Jesus to restore the sick. Lepers came to him and he healed them. Blind Bartimaeus cried out to him for mercy and the Lord restored his sight. He made the lame walk and the deaf hear. He even raised the dead and gave them back to their loved ones. People came to him in their misery and he took their misery away. Again and again he demonstrated his willingness and his power to restore and to renew this fallen world. 
But then when he came across demons, it was a different story, wasn't it? This evening we'll be reading Luke 4, which includes the story of the time when the Lord was in a synagogue and a man who was possessed by a demon was there. And the demon cried out, have you come to destroy us? That demon knew that the Lord Jesus has the power not only to restore, but to destroy. And in Luke 8, there's a story of the man who was possessed with a legion of demons. And when they saw the Lord, they begged the Lord not to torture them. And not to send them away into the abyss. So demons and evil spirits were terrified of the Lord Jesus. Because they knew that he is God. And that he has the power to destroy. As well as to restore. And so in Matthew 10 and Luke 12. The Lord warned us not to fear those who can kill the body. uh, But not the soul. So that's what people can do one person can kill another person's body and when that happens the person's uh, the dead person's body is buried in the ground but their soul remains alive and it returns to God who made it so Jesus said don't fear those who can only kill the body instead said the Lord Jesus you should be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell and so he's referring to himself To God. God is the only one who has the power to destroy us in body and soul. The Lord said in Matthew 25 that when he comes in his glory and with his angels to judge the living and the dead, he'll separate the righteous from everyone else. So the righteous, all his people who believed in him and who were therefore declared right in God's sight, they'll be invited to take their inheritance, which is eternal life in the presence of God, which God prepared for them before the world was made. But then he'll send the rest away into eternal punishment, which he prepared for the devil and his wicked angels. He'll destroy them in body and soul in hell. And then right at the end of the Bible, we read about the new heavens and earth where all of God's people will live with him forever in perfect peace and rest. So when Christ comes again, uh, God will renew the whole world. He'll renew the heavens and the earth completely. He'll renew his people completely too and bring them into his presence. And the former things, all the sorrow and sadness and disease and death of this life will pass away and be no more. And God's people will be happy forever and they'll drink from the water of life and live forever. That's God's power to restore and to renew. But at the end of the Bible, we also see God's power to destroy because we read of a great white throne in heaven. God is seated on the throne and everyone who's ever lived will be made to stand before the throne. And it says that books will be opened and these books contain a record of everything we have ever done. Uh, So everything we've done, everything we said, everything we've thought. And it says that each person was judged according to what he had done. And of course, the record of what we have done will show that that all of us have done wrong. All of us are are sinners from the moment we were conceived and every day we sin against the Lord and we disobey him in thought and word and deed. And so the record of what we have done will show that all of us have done wrong. All of us have offended the Lord by the things we have thought and said and done. And since that's true, then all of us deserve what happens next which is that they were thrown into the lake of fire to be punished forever for all that they have done wrong. The Lord Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and not the soul, but be afraid of the one who can kill both body and soul in hell. The Lord is not only able to restore, but he's also able to destroy. And yet right after telling us about the the record books of all that we have done, uh, we read about another book. It's called the book of life. And it says in Revelation 20 that that only those whose names are not written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. So, So we all deserve to be thrown into the lake of fire because the record will show that all of us have done wrong and we've offended God by the things we've done wrong. We all deserve to be destroyed. And yet, because God is gracious and merciful, not everyone is destroyed. Those whose names are written in the book of life will live. They'll live with God in the new heavens and earth. So what is the book of life? 
Well, it's about containing the names of everyone for whom Christ died. No one deserves to have their name written in that book because all of us have sinned and deserve to die. But because the Lord is gracious and merciful, the book of life will be filled up with name after name after name. So many names are like the stars in the sky, like the sand in the seashore, because there are too many of them to count. They're the names of those for whom Christ died. And so he came into the world for them and he suffered and died on the cross for them. He laid down his life for them to pay for all that they had done wrong. His blood, in a sense, washes away the record of what they have done wrong. It washes away all of their guilt. And because of what Christ did for them, they'll not be destroyed. Instead, they'll be restored and renewed completely and made perfect. And they'll live with God forever and forever. And so how can anyone tell whether their name is written in the book of life? Well, it's, it's simple, really. Anyone can tell. How can you tell? Well, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in him and him alone for peace with God? That's the sign that your name is written there because faith in Christ is a sign of belonging to Christ. Before the world was made, God chose those who would belong to Christ and who would live with him forever. And then he sent his spirit into their, li into their lives to enable them to believe in Christ. And so if you believe, it's because your name is written there in that book of life. And whoever's name is written there will never, ever be thrown into the lake of fire. Even though you deserve to be destroyed, you'll receive eternal life in the presence of God. And so today's chapter is an unpleasant one. Joram was killed, Ahaziah was killed, Jezebel was killed, and her body was eaten by dogs. It's an unpleasant chapter. But it's a chapter which shows us the other side of God's power. God not only restores, but he also destroys. But thanks be to God, because there are two sides to his power. He not only has the power to destroy, but he also has the power to restore and to renew and to give eternal life. To all who believe in his son. Which is why we all have to believe in his son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father we do bow before you. Because you alone are God. The sovereign Lord who rules over all that you've made. And you're the one with power to restore and save but you're also the one who has the power to destroy and to punish. We know, Lord God, that we all deserve to be punished because all of us are lawbreakers. We sin against you every day. But we thank you for your grace and your mercy and for the promise that whoever believes in your son will not be destroyed but have eternal life. And so we praise you because you alone are God. And we pray that you'll give us all the faith that we need to trust in Christ for salvation. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's uh, stand to sing, Jesus shall reign.
forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.